it's starting to record. It may not do it, man. Let's see. Come on now, work with me. Anyway, I'm not going to fool. I'm just going to. We'll see if it shows up or not. All right. That's not going to work. Okay, tonight, there's a lot going on. A couple of years ago, I wrote a book called Life and the Love of Life. And um, the impetus, the, the, the thing that kind of drove that was one thing, and the thing that helped me finish it was quite another. But the beginning of this, I'm going to read the first, the introduction and the chapter and discuss it. And anyone that has any questions, feel free to, to, to pop out and say, hey, wait a minute now, what about this? I'm more than willing to, to discuss anything I've written or worked with. Uh, if anyone has a question or a comment, or I might be wrong. Um, and if I, if I come out across that way, let me know. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing all this to be right. I think you're probably right, stanza 34. But I opened up the book with a real simple question. What are we all doing here if the stories which we consider to be our Lord do not contain any mystical element necessary to help us navigate through life? I've seen a lot of people denigrate that. Are we to be confined to a life where we must have grand expectations of miracles to justify our belief system? I see a lot of people spend a lot of time looking for signs. They are always looking for a sign that we are living our very best life. Furthermore, what if every bit of the lore is as true as all of the rest of the religious literature human beings have come to value? I think that's something we need to take into consideration. Do these writings still contain a moral compass capable of assisting a man or woman to simply get through day-to-day -day life? What about now in these times? Because that's, I think, what a lot of people are looking for. How much inf information is contained in the great monuments, literature, and concepts of these ancient tribes that have had to nav navigate such radical upheavals in societal structure? The truth of what these heretofore faiths, now labeled as mythologies, represents might be a shocking revelation to our world indeed. That's kind of why it's real important that everything we do, people are looking at that. At some point in every discussion about ancient civilizations, great and magnificent civilizations, there must be acknowledgement that these great societies were not monotheistic, one supreme being alone, as we know it. What would it look like if they provided us the instruction necessary to ensure the survival of not only the information, and that's a key point there, not only the information, but an elevated way of life, spiritually and mentally, why it would place us squarely at the center and no longer the fringe of the spirit that the established norms of what modern science holds to be worth knowing. We are kind of at that crossroads right now. Are we not? Because we are truly are faced with some stressful times. Most importantly, we might fulfill that crucial element of people who have known the truth of things for a very long time and yet have been categorized as individuals who will swallow a camel, yet strain at a gnat. There's a lot of people that when we talk about things, they're like, oh, he's a little bit too loony. He's a little bit too far out there. He's taken the wrong pill or he's done too much drugs or something. But now all of a sudden, some of that stuff that we talk about as the fringes, what does it cost me to buy into that in such radical times? Well, I don't change any. It doesn't cost me anything. Is there a value to that? What is the kernel of truth to be found in that? Every day I see or hear some new tidbit of information which lines up a profound and new manner of thinking. But who could possibly put them all together without sounding like uh, an episode of the latest alien conspiracy theory? It becomes quite difficult, doesn't it? For how long now have somebody, has someone asked us, well, what is your belief? And you gotta go into a 30 minute dissertation of what also true really means, and, or Hellenissimos, or Kematism, or your Slavic pathologies. You see, on another front, I have seen countless people proclaim that the lore is too heavily Christianized. And that creates a real enigma. That, that comes from, um, that comes from an author in the 17th century. It wasn't old worm. I think it was uh, Stenius or something like that. But what if it appears that way because the lore is where they came up with the foundation for a religion used to conquer as much of the world as possible? 
the foundations of what we believed were turned on its head and the concept of our unique ability to communicate with the divine to become something more was corrupted and an intercessor put into place. Ever hear of people eating apples in the desert? Well, it's not a common occurrence. And yet, people will buy that lock, stock, and barrel without thinking twice. Up until now, my books have focused on the layers of wisdom contained in the lore. Each layer removed confronts us with a new depth to our own spirituality. And this book that I'm reading now is yet another layer removed as we approach the core of our being. But it also may serve as an answer to longtime critics, and sometimes deservedly so, of flighty New Age beliefs, and pull from the greatest of them a treasure in the form of a moral compass we have always known was there, but had confined our vision of it to expected signs. Still unawares that the greatest power of our existence resides within us, our thinking process, and not anywhere out there. That's been the big problem that the greatest part of who and what we are resides somewhere out there, when the truth of the matter is it's right here within us and how we think and perceive just about everything. Now, I have outlined these new ideas around our ability to use them to better our lives. But I have framed them within the context of the various great destructions of the world, which is kind of important right now. Again and again, disasters, both natural and man-made, have destroyed fantastic civilizations. Literally, the world is littered with the skeletons of magnificent civilizations. But people still survived, didn't they? Now I'm going to show you a series of ideas which, when taken all together, provides us with yet another feast of information. But this one is not only for the mind, this one is for the whole man a banquet of fresh food for the body, mind, and spirit, which represents so much more than mere archeological rabbit hole of conspiracies. This is the book which will provide a moral compass more than sufficient to justify to the world why we went left on our path of life instead of following the conditioned herd. Because I think that's kind of how we feel sometimes. It's a real double-edged sword when we take that path less traveled because now all of a sudden, we begin to feel more special than. Now all of a sudden we begin to feel separate from. And the greatest amount of pain most individuals feel is when they identify their being by how much they are separate from the world in which they live in. During the writing of this book, I realized something amazing. Oh shit, I might cry about this. <laughs> One day I was, I was simply being present in the moment, which is real important. I lost count of how many monarch butterflies I saw. They were migrating to somewhere in Mexico. I stopped and I took a minute to watch them. See, not a single one of them flew in a straight line. All of them seemed to be at the mercy of the wind. Many of them will die without ever reaching their destination, but many will make it. How is it then that with all of the gifts we possess, we simply cannot find our way in life? People struggling and confused. See, I assure you, the butterfly is not focused on many things other than his destination. He's not waiting on any god or government to make sure he gets where he is going. Though his path may look like madness, the focus on his destination is not. And that's something we need to adopt. Quit waiting on gods and governments to support you. Don't worry if your path has been erratic and troubled in life. Focus. Focus with the greatest, most powerful and creative tool in the world, your mind, and you will get to where you are going. That moment was a moment that my father had died several years before that, and I struggled with that. His death left kind of a hole in me, as it does for many men. But something about those monarchs allowed me to realize a moment of peace and that my father did the best that he could. It was a real healing moment there. I don't have to figure it out. I'll dig it out, but not right now. Now, let's go back in time and let's discuss how this all kind of comes about and why this idea of focus is so important. Because our species has been through the kind of scenarios we're dealing with many times in the past. They are environmental, there is disease, there is war. During the Middle Ages, there were environmental deviations from the norm, much as we have been afraid about now. We have typically referred to them as the mini ice age. And I think that was, there was one in about 500 and there was one in about 1300. Now I'm going to talk about a couple of them, which we know about in the recorded history of Europe. 
one of which is from a story in the lore of Ossetru. And everybody's seen that image of that great king standing up naked, blah, blah, blah. And around 320, a Swedish king, Demolder Visborsson, was sacrificed. For three long years, his kingdom had endured multiple failures of agriculture, famine, and his companions became common guests in the villages of the kingdom. And most certainly, death made itself well known in this hard time. This was not what we know as the Middle Ages, these were the Dark Ages. Now, the Council of Chieftains came together in response to the hard times the people were facing. They resolved to sacrifice an auction. Now, this is a great sacrifice indeed in a country suffering the failure of agriculture and hunger. To have a connection with your God so powerful that you would sacrifice a great beast of burden in the hopes that the gods might smile upon your efforts to send that life energy back in exchange a gift for a gift. This is a powerful thing in this day and age. It didn't work. The second year they sacrificed men, an even more powerful sacrifice, one which speaks to the desperation of the people that the best efforts of men who could work the fields might be better employed to entreat the gods on their behalf. Think about that level of faith and compare it to our own. In the third year, it was decided in the most crucial of times that the king himself should seek the gods on behalf of his people, and he was sacrificed. Following this, the country returned to prosperity. 200 years later, we find a similar tale, and we also find the reason for it. Now, the Little Ice Age cooling of the 6th century, between 536 and 544 CE, there is a second, there is a record of dramatic atmospheric event which caused severe hardship upon the inhabitants of Northern Europe. So here we have a 200 year gap. Couple that with the Saxon invasions, people seeking new resources of their own during this time, and you have a great need for a hero. Now this information was first given to us in the great Arthurian myths penned in around 830 CE by the monk Nenius. His rec he records the legend of King Arthur and the Grail quest. And it is here along with Beowulf that we find the evidence of monotheism poisoning the well, so to speak. Now the Grail quest was a quest to heal the king and the land because the land and the king were one. Just like, just like that Swedish king when he was sacrificed, the land and the king were one. The king had a wound which not healed, the land was suffering as well. For weeks at a time, the sun would not shine, clouds covered the sky and crops would not grow. It was cold, a time of hunger and loss of crops, famine and weakness befell the kingdom. Now these stories did not become prominent in the, record rec in the written record until over 300 years after they were coined by Nenius. This is the time when the great cathedrals were under construction and Adam of Bremen had begun his legendary collection of writings about 1130 to 1280. These stories about Arthurian days were fully fleshed out as stories to cement the transition from wounded pagans to whole and healthy Christians. They were committed to paper and became legend. I see the land had succumbed to blight. It had become a wasteland. The feeling that they needed divine intercession was capitalized upon. He was sick and in decline and the land reflected that. Now, if one were to take an honest look at society, one might be tempted to conclude that it is a wasteland every time you step outside your front door, even more so today. Be that as it may, men were at the mercy of the environment and there were no gods stepping forth to change it for them this time. The honor of a king sacrificing himself might have been a thing of the past by now, but it was a perfect time for a king to sell out to the conquering faith. But let's take a look at the environment of that time. Dendrochronologists, the people that studied the tree rings, have studied this time and during the Grail Quest for eight or ten years. There's a dendrochronologist named Mike Bailey. His research has shown that the serious global cooling was occurring, and as a result, tree growth stopped weeks at a time. The sun was not visible. There were multiple collapses of harvest, the people were malnourished, and then famine set in. People developed a weakened immune system, and the luxuries of ancient civilizations, such as running water, fell by the wayside. As a result, in 542 CE, we see the eruption of disease in the form of the Justinian plague. Cold, the collapse of agriculture, and then plague. It took Europe 300 years to recover from that. The medieval warm period around 900 AD allowed the sea ice to begin to retract and the sea lanes opened again. The peoples of Northern Europe took advantage of this with sailing routes to Greenland, Iceland, Great Britain, and the Americas. 
agriculture rebounded with a surplus of food, economies began to strengthen. When a society has lots of food, people increased in height, four or five inches from the dark ages. Now there was a wealth and the population expanded. After 150 years of warmth, European society began building cathedrals. Thousands of well-trained craftsmen worked on this activity. All of this shows up in a geologic instant. Who organized this? Who trained these craftsmen? This glorious consequence of the expansions of wealth from warm weather. Christianity took advantage of this unique and very cyclical occurrence and has long been hailed as the savior of Europe and then it stopped in the early 1300s. At that time was the onset of the Little Ice Age. Once again, we have an agricultural lapse, famine, and finally the Black Plague strikes, wiping out another one third of Europe. The sad thing is that when these plagues strike, they affect two parts of society, the young and the old. The old possess the knowledge of how to train the young. Who knows what very valuable information we are, may have lost from the devastating effects of a plague ridden Europe. That concept of, of a society passing down the necessary info which made it great, which allowed it to survive such events, is crucial to everything in this book. In all of these instances, there is evidence of a comet changing the atmosphere of the planet. The ancient people referred to these comets and meteorites as hailstones. Now, whatever your understanding of the ruined Hagalaz is, it might change a little bit. If you consider solar flares and volcanoes, we begin to see how our tenuous grip to life on this planet truly is. This type of cycle occurred in other areas of the world as well. While everyone is aware of the fall of Rome around 456 AD, few people are cognizant of the fall of Egypt in 1177 or 1186, depending on the archeologist you speak with. The standard line has always been that it was the Sea Peoples, but new studies done by Eric Klein in his book 1177 points out that there were several civilizations alongside Egypt, which created a world economy, much like we have now. As this trade route was interrupted, there are written records of what happened, a drought which lasted 300 years. There was also evidence of a comet striking near Southern modern day Iraq. The Sea People's invaders were actually refugees. These boats were filled with families as well as warriors. As the Minoans, Canaanites, and Hittites, and many others fell by the wayside, other city-states began to rise. Egypt, though, truly never recovered. The trade route for tin from Afghanistan and copper from Turkey fell into disuse and wasn't truly recovered until Alexander the Great, 1100 years later. Now, if we go for even further back in the reign of Akhenaten with his grand vizier Thutmosis, who we know as Moses, which means son of, we see in documents literally around the world of a red disc in the sky with 10 tails beaming down at the planet. From China to Egypt, there are written records of a light in the sky brighter than the moon and rivaling the sun. This coincides with the birth of monotheism when Akhenaten freed a group of people who were Semites and the volcano at Santorini erupted, you have a ready-made case for monotheism to stick as it were. Such was the birth of Judeo-Christian belief. In the meantime, further north, one great king of Sweden began to gather his copper from Michigan and his tin from Cornwall. The only reason the Romans went to Great Britain was to get the tin. This was beautifully written out on a rock from the Bronze Age in Canada at Peterborough. In Serbia, there has been a copper axe head founded, found dated to 7,500 BCE. Where do you suppose that material came from? Well, it's a world economy indeed. You see, there is a big picture. It is a much bigger picture than we currently imagine. We have been in this boat before and we have survived. For centuries, mankind has struggled to focus in on the, this kaleidoscope of information. We've no need to, now we do. A whirling pattern of pertinent information from the latest scientific or religious evidence concerning life on earth. Yet the lens with which this effort has been viewed is of the wrong integrity. It is a grainy and tinted lens forged in the fires of men's egos and the righteous indignation of monotheistic belief. They tell us we needn't even bother to look. See the answers to our question, the remedy for this wholesale loss of our history as a species is to be found in our mythologies. Perhaps the concept encapsulated in the ruin and Sue's, our ancestral knowledge. For the follower of Ossetrude, Leif and Leithersir, life and the love of life, are represented as our lore. For us to understand the dynamic information which will shatter the foundations of a world which we have largely left behind, but now all of a sudden we're sucked back into. 
it is of the utmost importance that we view it all as a people who practice the faith which make the world around us sacred again. We will not survive the future falls of civilization with this very valuable body of learning intact or ourselves and way of life if we do not. This is literally a lifeline of ancestral wisdom given to us to help us navigate these very troubling times. Because the evidence is very powerful that time and again, this planet and the peoples of on it have had to rebuild from disasters of cosmic proportion. But what if they could not? What if the impact was severe enough that more than one civilization was wiped out and important technology seemingly lost? The common impact of the Younger Dryas provides such an occurrence. And it does so in the foundation of archeological thought. So we're going way back here. At the end of the last glacial maximum, 12,800 years ago, there was a sudden warming followed by a sudden cooling that threw us right back into a period of glaciation 11,300 years ago. All over the earth, there's evidence that a comet struck the Laurentide ice sheet. The strike literally wiped out anything which might have existed in six Western states. It caused Lake Bonneville to create the Snake River Canyon. It caused the Velez volcanic crater to fill up and burst its caldera wall. The impact on the Laurentide ice sheet created a tidal wave of, full of gigantic boulders and water which swept across the Pacific Northwest. Evidence suggests that this tidal wave of debris reached up to 1,250 feet high. The debris trail of boulders as big as houses have been left there like a ring in an old bathtub. Similar events occurring in the Dakotas and present-day Minnesota from the same comet. New evidence from the Woods Hole Oceanic Institute shows that similar amount of fresh water flowed into the Arctic Ocean and disrupted the oceanic warming mechanism for the planet, the Gulf Stream for one, which is right now happening. The sea level rose 400 feet, and any evidence of civilization over 10 million square miles of coastline was eradicated. That's the size of China and Europe. Imagine what might be found there. Life became a cheap commodity in the face of such a cosmic event. 35 genera went extinct in the North American continent, including the Clovis culture. At the same time all this is happening, there are continent-wide wildfires burning everything down. Above every Clovis culture site, there is a layer of black mat created by this ash of fire. So things have been tougher and we have survived. But when we're not talking about one event, when that comet struck, every six months, the earth goes through the debris stream of that comet. And for 20 years, every six months, these comets, these what the Romans called hailstones, rained down on our planet. <laughs> now, if you consider the Salutrian hypothesis where Europeans migrated across the North Atlantic, you ended up with an archeological argument that holds no real reason to justify this movement of people. The economy might, economy might be one, but it's much more likely that the Salutrian hypothesis is backwards. It is a group of refugees fleeing a continent-wide wildfire destruction on a level we might only see in a movie. If you take the after death path that the Mississippi and Indian cultures outline and lay them over the path of the dead as the Egyptians outline, they fit hand in glove. The Milky Way and the great river that they both exist by, the path of the dead, it's astonishing when you begin to line them up. Most major cities are located at the mouth of rivers. Some of these people would have been out at sea, engaging in the fishing or sailing or a trade route when these disastrous occurrences reshaped the futures of all men. These are the individuals who would have survived. They would have carried the legends which were most important to them forward in time. But let's look at a list of the timeline of common impacts on planet Earth in recent history and consider some of the changes I've referenced above. <laughs> we had one, I'm not going to read all that, from 16,300 years ago up to, <laughs> up to, uh, good night, up to 1,000 years ago, up to 500 years ago. Again and again and again, we've been hit by something. Given the sheer volume of these impacts and the catastrophic damage each, each impact has occurred, it may well be time to re-examine the entirety of what we think the Ruin Hager Laws means, or all of them for that matter. The runes provide us a clue that they are a pattern for negotiating life. Leaf and leaf is here. Life and the love of life are the examples of how we should, in order, should be in order to use them. Separated from the nonsense of this world, 
but this is not meant in the same misunderstood of mindset of deny yourself, such as Christians promote it, quite the opposite. It means we must build ourselves. Now it continues on, there's some illustrations there, but this is what I'm talking about in this day and age. We have been through so much in just the 20th century alone. If you look at, let's start with just the 20th century. So in 1918, we had the Spanish flu that went around the world twice. Millions of people died. Then we had World War I. Millions more people died. So the old fell in the Spanish flu. The young died in the war. So the knowledge to move forward, and this has happened all throughout history. The Earth Atlas Shrugged is an apt time idea for this. This knowledge has been lost, but one thing has, well, we'll continue on. Then you had the Great Depression where you had famine. Then you had World War II where the United States alone had 16 million men and women in service. Millions and millions of people died all over the globe. Then you had the, you know, in the 1917, you had the Communist Revolution. Who knows how many millions of people died? I'll tell you, it was such a heinous thing is that they were low to save money on bullets. They would take the prisoners out of the gulag, have them dig a hole, then they would get in the hole and save money on the bullets. They would bury them alive because they were political opposites. Radical times create radical beliefs for people. And this is very difficult for us to understand. Now, World War II, then you had the cold, then you had the communist revolution in China where we know of at least 10 million that were killed to establish that state. We have lost in the 20th century alone, millions and millions and millions of people. And all of a sudden, during the summer of love or somewhere there about in the age of Aquarius, a new set of thoughts found its way into our common culture. If you look at everything that happened up to that point in the late 60s, you can see why a generation would be exhausted from the constant loss of life among their family and friends all over the world. What an exhausting time to grow up in. How desensitized must we have become to see thousands and millions of people killed at random so somebody could be right? And then a disease to come along on top of that what began to spiral out of control. I think being the grandchild and the children of those generations, I'm looking at what's going on now. I think the greatest fear is that we have so much uncertainty. What will this look like? What will be the outcome? How will I make this? What can I do to help someone believe in themselves instead of falling on their knees and praying for someone to do it for them? If you look at the runes and you look at what they stand for, it is, it can be thought of as a linear message. Let me pull this up right here and I'll tell you what it looks like. Because it's a path of life. And I think that's the one thing we don't ever want, we never really look like. What is this path of life? What does it look like? How do we navigate this? When the old die, when we're afraid to talk to each other, when we're, how do we find this knowledge? Our gods have thrown us a lifeline. There are multiple pagan beliefs going on right now. In fact, I talked with a lady today in the Hellenistic faiths. She's wanting to organize some kind of ritual that, that crosses the boundaries of all these pagan faiths to make offering to our gods uh, for this time because we have to operate on ideas of faith. If our ancestors were willing to sacrifice oxen, men, and a king, should not we be willing to pour out a horn to ask our gods a gift for a gift to help this? But if you look at the runes, Fehu, this mobile wealth, if you build some mobile wealth, Urus, you're going to have to have a little bit of strength to protect you, and maybe Thurisaz, some strength from on high to defil to the, as the warder of men to protect you from those things that would steal it from you. You'll need to use Ansu's, the ancestral wisdom, on Raidho, the journey of life, and that will be a torch of inspiration. You'll get a fine gift from Gabo, and you'll be able to enjoy Wunjo, some joy. 
But even after that, if you look at a man's life, he goes up till he gets to the midlife crisis and then hogalize, radical change. And then it becomes a time of need and everything seems to be frozen and nothing's moving fast enough. And then you're gonna harvest the way you've been living. <coughs> up under the tree, you might get a little rest. Perth throws the lock cup. What will happen? We don't know. Algae is the rune of protection. And then you might have a little success. If you kill an elk, you're gonna feed the entire community. And then Sawilo, it's a time of success. And then Tiwas, that leader, that leader of the tribe who's willing to make the just sacrifice to protect his family and friends. And then there'll be new growth in Burkano. It was, and then man as man becoming more. Lagu's the interconnectedness of all things. We're all connected. I don't see myself separate from you. I begin to love the things I see of myself in you. And then my perception begins to change in the world. Ingus, then I can cultivate and develop the God seed, that ing, that be ing, do ing, that, that rune of fray. And then the new day begins to dawn, and then we find Othala, our ancestral homeland. Now we can take them as individual runes if we want to, but we can also find a real clear message of what life is like for most average people. Right now, we're dealing with perhaps a time of need. And those things that we have done, we've lived, that we have prepared for, that we have taken responsibility for our own life on this planet, instead of waiting on someone else to take responsibility for how we live, why we might come out the other side of this okay. That's the whole benefit of being also true. When we begin to take responsibility for how we live on this planet, for our comfort, for our food, self-reliance, industriousness, and perseverance, then we got a chance then we got a chance to show the entire world what we're made of, what we can become, that we can stand strong, and people are gonna to gravitate towards us. Let's make sure when we're looking at all this, these are not lessons we haven't learned before. These are the lessons our grandparents went through, our parents went through. This is us becoming something more. We've made that radical deviation from the path of norm that of the established society. We see sometimes that it might be ready to devour itself. How do we stand up with this pagan faith, this radical deviation, that everyone looks askance at, that talks about out of the side of their mouth, that wants to run their mouth because they think they know something. Well, they're going <laughs> this is our opportunity to stand up, stand together, take care of each other, and maybe become something more. All pain is growth. And there's parts of what's coming up in the next month or two months that are going to absolutely suck. There's no doubt about it. But we have within ourselves what it takes to become something more. All of our ancestors made it through everything I outlined to come together and love someone else to bring us to this world today. If they had what it takes to make it through, don't you think we do too? And that's what we got to begin discussing with each other. We have what it takes. Yeah, we're gonna to have to make some sacrifices. Some of them are gonna suck. But that doesn't mean we give up and wait on someone else to handle the best aspects of our life. That doesn't mean we wait up and wait on someone to give us permission to love those people around us. At the end of the day, that's all we got is giving a shit about the guy next to us and helping to move forward, get up, try it again. Now, I would tell everybody at this point, you go out Monday morning, grab life by the nose and whip it ass. But really, I'm going to tell you, wash your hands and don't go anywhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? Stay at home and take care of yourself. Um, buy some colloidal silver. It's probably going to kill it. Probably going to work for everybody. Um, I think you can still buy it on Amazon. Maybe. Some of the health food stores might have it. There's your virus protection right there. Give it a shot. Lane, quit smoking. You're going to need your lungs, boy. Good night. <laughs> anyway that's all i got for this evening I, I believe everybody has what it takes to do it and i am going to follow up on this thing with the hellenistics about doing a, a cross pagan boundary mass ritual if anyone has any questions about anything i talked about i would love to talk with you about it if anyone I needs somebody to hold their hand when things get a little bit tight or you get a little bit unsure my number you can call me on messenger i will answer that phone yeah, I think the idea of a cross pagan uh, ritual is a is a is a neat, interesting idea. 
You know, and I know I'm no one big in the AFA community, but he says I, you. me personally, I mean, I am I am currently trying to become someone big in the AFA community, but I'm still a little fish so far. You know, each one of us has something very special to offer to contribute. Don't um, don't don't let your thought process tell you that you ain't somebody ever. I mean, you, you're going to build your future. That's, that's on you. Build it. Make a name for yourself. You know, I started writing a book. Who, who the hell was I to write a book? I did it anyway. And the first books, they, they suck. You know, I'm just going to tell you, they're not the greatest pieces of literature you're going to find. But uh, as Speaking I, of, I'll have eight of your books. Oh, shit, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> I uh I was able to get them because I have a Kindle Fire, and I okay. I have an I have an account with uh Kindle Fire, and it let me get eight of your books. Uh, I thank you for that, man. I really do. I appreciate that. Now I haven't had a time. I haven't had some time to actually sit down and read them, but I have uh I have. Uh, Aegir's Feast and Asatru Life, uh, The Goddess of Asatru, uh, A Drink from Mimir's Will, uh, Well, uh, Hell, the Sun Facing Goddess, uh, Life of Life and the Love of Life, A Noble Minded Heathen, and Churbuck. Man, those are the best ones. Those are the best ones, but um, uh, A Noble Minded Heathen is, uh, I think that's five books in one. All you do is buy that one book, man. And I'd send them others back and just keep a noble minded heathen in life and the love and um uh, and truer Yeah. They're they're good. I, they're good. I know a lot of people really like a drink from him as well. Uh so as to that stanza that we were talking about earlier, I believe it is stanza thirty four. Probably is. Probably. And uh, now it it doesn't exactly say what you had said, but out of all of the stanzas that I've skimmed through, this one sounds the more like it. Uh, yeah. And it says, "Long is and indirect the way to a bad friend's, though by the road he dwell, but to a good friend's the path lie direct, though he lives far away." And that's yeah, that's the benefit of, te of this technology right here. This is a direct connection for all of us. And man, we might be thousands of miles apart. You know, you know, I don't see anybody on here that's close to me. Um, I think Melissa's she's three hours away. Um, but that's that's the deal right there. This this technology has allowed us to create that path to each other. And heck, I'm in North Maine right now. <laughs> there you go. You're long. You're you're long. You're a fair piece off the mark, fella. I don't know. <laughs> but this is. Um, this is where we are, guys. I mean, this is this is really where we are. This is where we got to grab a hold of these tenets of faith and really cultivate what we're worth. And um, that path of everything we're going to go through is outlined in the rooms. And I know there's going to be people that want to argue with me about that, and I really don't care. But uh, that's just what I see. And I see some things that are going to help me make it through whatever's coming up, provided I don't get sick and die. And if I do that, my kids are going to be awesome because my books are going to go through the roof. I still win. <laughs> okay. Does anybody have any questions or anything else they want to talk about? Oh, all right, then. I'm going to Thank turn. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. That was awesome. I do think you should probably start reading your own books because that was really soothing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the recording equipment yet, but yeah, I need to read my, I need to, re, I need to read. It just sounds, I, I love the recordings you do. I love the audio books, but there's something to you reading. <laughs> just saying, just saying. Thank, Thank you. you for that, Brian. Thank you very Tammy much. Tammy says hello to everybody. I don't know if anybody saw that, but. I didn't see it, but yeah, I'm glad she's, I'm glad she showed. There it is. I'm glad you joined in, Ron. That's, I'm glad you're here, bud. Yeah, like always, man, it's been a great session. I love being able to be here, you know, even though most of the time I'm driving and I forget that, oh, hey, you know, 
it, it's meeting time, you know, time to, time to learn. You All know. Right. I'm glad you jumped in, man. Look, thankfully, to- thankfully I woke up <laughs> and I Good. wasn't, uh, I wasn't too late getting in here. Yeah. Melissa, I didn't get, that didn't work right. I might figure that out how to do that, but there was something I was supposed to, an additional step I ignored. That'd be all, we'll figure it out next time. But yeah, I'm going to start doing that. All right, guys. Shay, you doing all right, bub? Yeah, I've been doing good. Been working good. in the garden today. I saw that. Out there laboring until the sun went down. That's good <laughs> stuff. I've been putting off pulling out some trees. I let some trees go, and I was trying to give them away, and I ended up letting them grow in the garden all last year, and they got pretty big. So it was one of these chores I was dreading, and I finally did it. <laughs> so. I didn't want to stop while I had that momentum, you know. Shit, no. Shit, no. What, do you grow fruit trees? Yeah, I like perennials. So my I have raised beds that are empty, and some remnants and volunteers of things still pop up from years past. But uh, oh, yeah. I like I like oh, to do yeah. fruit trees, which is... There, there's an apple called an Arkansas black. It's the ugliest piece of fruit you'll ever see in your life. It looks like it has scab or anything, but that it's an apple that tastes exactly like an apple Jolly Rancher. It is mm-hmm. the most delicious apple I've ever eaten. My grandpa used to grow them. I'll look it up. Yeah, if you ever come across one, they're worth it. Yeah, I'm willing to wait. <laughs> they're good. <laughs> they're really good. The deer love them too, the damn bad. <laughs> I got dogs around. My dogs are such great friends. They're... <laughs> they are- uh, they are so busy all the time. They're such they're a good company. I've been quarantined with them, so I'm appreciating their, their company for sure. Oh gosh, it's coming here too. Uh, well, yeah, I'm just I'm self quarantined you know, for the weekend. I'm just staying home. Right. Yeah. I'm supposed to. I hear tell them all of the states are getting are fixing to get quarantined as soon as the uh, national guard gets rounded up. Like full nationwide quarantine. Yeah, I've heard that. I mean, we're going to have to do something because these people, are, you know, all these little contractors, they're needing everybody to go to work so they don't go bankrupt, and they really don't care if anybody gets sick. They just don't want to go bankrupt, and I'm sitting here thinking, I don't care if you starve to death. Mm-hmm. The little, yeah. the little general contractors won't be able to make it; they'll go bankrupt. The subcontractors. They can probably pull through. They're small enough and nimble enough they can make it. But uh, but the guys that have bit off the big jobs, it's gonna it's gonna be delayed. Their timelines are August for opening these schools. They're just it's gonna be hard on them. It's gonna be real hard on them. Um, there's some and there's some really good people work for some of these people that I know. But then they're gonna have to shut down. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's why we need to stick together. That's why we need to reach out. I don't have much, but uh, if somebody needs something, you make sure you call me. I mean, I did operate Nana's Hearth for a long time. I'll find something. I'll find something. And if we have to, we'll 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 raid the church or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll go back to our roots. <laughs> yeah, or raid the English. Pass on people's wish lists or their needs. Maybe one of us can help. That's the thing is um, I'd like to see people on that noble-minded heathen keep each, other, keep each other abreast of what's going on, where the shortages are, what the concerns are. And um, we got we to gotta make it. We just got to make it. Yeah, because I want my little girl to be an astronaut and go into space. And I want her to take my books. At any rate, so, take care of each bye. other, and uh, I'm going to get off here. Later, Brian. Hey, guys. We'll see you, Heather. Bye-bye.